is Let's Rejoice says happy birthday to Fraserburgh. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Fraserburgh and the Old Parish Church here. We've all gathered here this morning, as we always do at this time, to praise God and to rejoice in His love for us. We've all gathered here today, the whole family of the church, young people and not so young people, children from our Sunday schools, teenagers from our Bible class, young people from our youth organizations, together with their parents, their grandparents, their families and friends. We are all here this morning, and more especially, so are you, joining in our worship at home. We hope that you'll join with us in our singing and our praying and our listening as we rejoice in our community, our town of Fraserburgh, which is 400 years old this year. So, happy birthday, Fraserburgh. And we're all going to sing a new hymn now that has been especially composed for the occasion to a new tune, which is called, Would You Believe, Fraserburgh Old? And as you sing the words along with us, I hope that you'll give thanks for your community, that place where you live. Thank you. 
Yes, we in our community of Fraserburgh are celebrating 400 years since our founding as a royal borough in 1592. And we're all looking forward to the visit in June of the Queen and Prince Philip. Your community, your town, your city may not be as old as this, or it may be older. But whatever its age, I think this is a good opportunity for you and for us to think about that place where we live, and all our friendships there, and all the people who sustain us day by day by their work and their effort. Ian is going to lead us now in a thanksgiving prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for all good things and that you crown our many blessings with the most wonderful gift of all, your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. We praise you and thank you for our community, for the town in which we live, for the employers in our town and those who work in shops and factories, for those who go to sea in boats and gather a rich harvest. For the harvests of oil and gas, we thank you, Heavenly Father. For those who teach in our schools and all who learn there. For doctors and nurses and all who tend the sick in body or mind. For policemen, ambulance men, and firemen. For social workers, home helps, and all who look after the elderly for ministers, priests and pastors, and the congregations that they serve. For the whole life of the area in which we live, we give you great thanks, Heavenly Father. We remember those in times past, O God, who have enriched our lives and the life of our community, those who have served you well in times past and from whom we have gained such a rich heritage. We thank you for them and for those we have loved who have died in the faith, that they are one with us still through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Living in community as we all do, we all depend very much on one another. No man is an island, we say, and how very true that is. In the very first pages of the Bible, we read that man, Adam, was made to have friendship, companionship with God, because even God, it seems, does not want to live alone. And God does not intend man to live alone either, and so he made for him a companion, Eve, woman. Our Sunday school children have been thinking about this recently, and they've made four posters to display to us today to fit four proverbs to do with living in community, to do with friendship. And Martin, I think, is going to tell us what the first proverb is. This proverb is from France. Friendship is the marriage of the soul. And I'm sure you'll agree that our Sunday school children have given a very interesting interpretation of this proverb. A number of soccer players. Here we have a, a, a Rangers player. Is that right? No. no. Uh, is this a Rangers player here in the center? No. No. Is this a Rangers player over here then? No. Well, it's not, no. no. Some of you realized. Who, who, is, who, is, who is he playing for? Does anyone know? Everton. Everton. Do we have any Everton supporters here? <coughs> not a lot. Have we any Rangers supporters here? Any Celtic supporters here? Not many. Let's ask if we've got many Don supporters in our midst. <laughs> Quite a lot hands down. Yes, we're reminded here of how important it is to belong to community, whether it's a, a football club, a, a group, an organization, but to live in the community in which we have grown up. Something that comes from deep within, something that's very difficult for us to express, but something that's very real and very precious to us. Something indeed which, no matter how long or how much you are separated from that community by time or distance, your mind, your heart, continually returns. And here, Sarah is going to tell us about our second proverb. This proverb is from Nigeria. Hold a true friend with both your hands. Hold a true friend with both your hands. This reminds us, of course, of how very, very precious our friendships are. And when we find a true friend, a friend that's kind and true and loyal, we should work hard at that friendship. Otherwise, if we neglect it, 
then we might spoil it or even destroy it. You see, sometimes we can take our friends for granted. So don't, don't let's hold a true friend with one hand. Let's hold him with both hands. Now, Kara has another proverb to tell us about here. This proverb is from China. Do not choose a hatchet to remove a fly from your friend's forehead. Now, this looks like quite a sore one, doesn't it? And our Chinese friend here doesn't look very happy about it either. It reminds us, of course, that none of us are perfect. And we live in a community that's made up of individuals who have all sorts of faults and failings. But we learn to be gentle with each other's faults. And if we need to correct them, then we do so kindly. To use the unkind or cruel wor word can so very easily destroy that friendship. No, we don't want to take a hatchet to remove a fly from our friend's forehead. And Debbie's going to tell us about our fourth proverb. This proverb is an English one. A friend needs a friend indeed. And it reminds us, surely, of all the friends and the friendships that we have in community. All the people to whom we should be thankful. Neighbours, family friends, but also, too, in our community, all our professional friends, who sometimes, perhaps, we take for granted. From the policeman to the doctor, from the dentist to the lawyer, from the teacher to the counsellor. All people who are there in time of need. A true story about friendship concerns two boys who were strangers to each other, ten-year-olds, Richard and Martin, and they found themselves in the same two-bedded side ward in the local hospital. Richard was the more active of the two, but like Martin, he too was confined to bed. His bed, however, was by the only window in the ward. At first, Martin was very ill and very depressed, and Richard succeeded in cheering up his day and every day. And then, as Martin grew in strength, Richard would brighten up every day by telling him of all the things that he saw out of the window. The daffodils growing in the park across the road, the children playing in the swings and the roundabouts, the people passing in the street below, old people and young people. And then the sad day came when the two friends had to part. Richard went away to convalesce, and Martin asked to be moved to the bed by the window. But the ward sister, giving very good reasons, refused. But it didn't stop Martin from asking. And one day, a new sister came to the ward, and she moved Martin to that window. And he looked out, and to his utter astonishment, his amazement, he saw only a blank brick wall, and down below, a squalid yard with a row of dustbins. Each day, Richard had used his vivid imagination to cheer up his friend's days, and he had succeeded. The greatest friendship of all, of course, is the friendship that we can have with Jesus Christ. Because, yes, too, Jesus needs friends. He gathered around him a circle of friends, his disciples. And we're going to hear how he called them now. As Jesus walked along the shore of Lake Galilee, he saw two brothers who were fishermen, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew, catching fish in the lake with a net. Jesus said to them, Come with me, and I will teach you to catch men. At once they left their nets and went with them. He went on and saw two other brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They were in their boat with the father Zebedee, getting their nets ready. Jesus called them, and at once they left the boat and their father and went with him. Amen. Peter. Yes, Jesus. Come with me. Where are you going? I'm not telling you. Do you not know? Oh, yes. I have a fair idea. Then why won't you tell me? You might not like it. Well, thanks for your consideration, Jesus. Peter. Yes, Jesus? Come with me. Can I bring somebody else? Just bring yourself. Will there just be the two of us? Oh, no. There will be plenty of others. Well, I know some of them. What about my cousin Alec? Will he be there? And is there any chance of my sister coming if she still fancies you? <laughs> and what about my granny? Oh, Jesus, I'd love to bring my granny to meet you, can I? Peter, just bring yourself. But 
But you said there would be others. That's right. Who are they? I'm not telling you. Why not? Mm, you might not like them. Oh, thanks a bunch, Jesus. Peter. Yes, Jesus. Come with me. Jesus, I've got better things to do than to go on a mystery tour. But I'll think about it. Just tell me what I'll need. What do you mean? Well, if I'm going somewhere I don't know, with people you refuse to tell me about, there are some things that might come in very handy. Like what? Like something to read in case I get bored. Like something to sing in case I get sad. Like a new pair of jeans in case there's a dance at a party. Peter, you'll not need anything. Just bring yourself. That's enough to contend with. Jesus, do you want me to end up like you? Peter, I'm going. Are you coming with me? That's the bottom line, isn't it? Jesus asks, are you coming with me? He doesn't offer us a complicated theological system or a long set of rules and regulations. He simply says, follow me. Come and live in my community so that you may then go out and enrich the whole community. Come with whatever gifts God has given you or has not given you. Come and follow me. We hope you've enjoyed your worship with us here in Fraserburgh this morning as much as we've enjoyed sharing that worship with you. During our next hymn, the babies and toddlers from our creche downstairs will be joining us. And then after the blessing, we are to have a special birthday celebration. So thank you for being with us.
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and fellowship in the Holy Spirit be upon each one of you and all those whom you know and love today and forevermore. Amen. looking ahead to some of the programmes for this Sunday afternoon on Grampian. At ten past one, Brian Gould speaks with Brian Walden. Then at two o'clock, we've some alternative sport with the 1991 World Climbing Finals. Jesse is still doing a hard time on planet Earth at three o'clock, and that's... <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to the old parish church of Fraserburgh. We have all gathered here this morning to worship God. Worship is the old English word worth-ship. It is the value or the worth that we place on God. And we've gathered here at this time, as we always do, to give God his rightful place at the beginning of another week. We're very pleased to welcome you with us this morning and hope that you'll join with us in our praying and our praising. Dorothy is going to lead us in prayer now. Heavenly Father, 
We come before you today as people of many families, ordinary people from all walks of life, from school, from our jobs, our professions, and in retirement. But we come, Father, here in your house and through our television screens as your people, joining together in worship as your special community, at one with you, united in faith and trust and in love. Help us in our worship time together to feel at one with you. Help us to feel a quickening and uplifting of our hearts as we reach out to you in our singing. Help us to feel refreshed inwardly as we talk to you in prayer and enable us through the Holy Spirit to see with the eyes of faith and to rejoice in your creative power in the gift of human life and in the sacrament of holy baptism. Grant us that this day and every day something will remind us that we want to praise and worship you. For you, Father, have made each one of us for yourself. We are special in your eyes. So draw close to us now, we pray. We ask this through our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. Amen. In our worship this morning, we're rejoicing in the community of faith, the church. And we're celebrating this by welcoming into our family of the church an infant and two adults, a husband and wife. The sacrament of holy baptism is, of course, the mark of entry into the Christian church. And from earliest times, we read in the Bible of whole households being baptized. And this must have included infants, as adults, who were the first converts to the Christian faith, sought a meaningful way by which they could welcome their children into the Christian family. Baptism, baptism is, of course, a sacrament. And a sacrament is many things. But it's a picture of realities that lie behind it, which it seeks to make visible and vivid to us. The central figure in this sacrament is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one in whom we focus our attention. It is he who baptizes, and indeed it is he who, before this child was even born, had already died for him. Well, about nine months ago, I suffered uh, two broken legs through being in a car crash. My wife and Linda and uh, my son Stephen were in the car at the same time as well. Linda suffered a broken collarbone caused by the seatbelt, and Stephen suffered whiplash caused by his seat belts in his uh, car seat. Uh, we feel now that uh, life is more precious because uh, it could have been a lot worse than what it actually was and I feel we were very lucky. And we realise now how lucky we are still being on this earth and uh, we feel that uh, John being, well Linda was pregnant at the time, so John being uh, also in the car in a sense I mean, he's very lucky to be here as well, I feel. And we feel that uh, he should be now be able to thank God for uh, what he's been through. Yes, we're looking forward to getting John christened on Sunday so he can be welcomed into the church. And uh, in later years, he'll be able to attend Sunday school with other children and uh, enjoy God with them and learn all about God and Jesus. And then in later life, when he's old enough to make his own decisions, then uh, hopefully he'll be able to take after our example. Some people brought children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples scolded the people. When Jesus noticed this, he was angry and said to his disciples, let the children come to me and do not stop them because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I assure you that whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Then he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on each of them, and blessed them. Amen. <laughs>
Ian and Linda, do you present your child for baptism today, earnestly desiring that he may be engrafted into Christ as a member of his body, the church? We do. Do you confess your faith in God as your creator and father, in Jesus as your savior and Lord, and in the Holy Spirit as your guide and helper? We do. Let us pray. Grant, eternal God, the presence of the risen Christ in this sacrament. Bless this water and fulfill your Pentecostal promise that this child, being born anew of water and the Holy Spirit, may become part of your new creation, united forever with Christ as a member of his body, the Church. Amen. John Fraser, it was for you that Christ Jesus came into the world and struggled and suffered. It was for you he endured the agony of Gethsemane and the darkness of Calvary. It was for you he died, and it was for you he conquered death. Yes, for you, little one, who as yet understand not these things. But thus are the words of the apostle confirmed, that we love God because God first loved us. John Fraser, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, descend upon you and remain in your heart forever. We have now done as Christ has commanded, and John Fraser McKinnon is received into his church and is commended to your care as a congregation of that church. John Fraser, the Lord bless you and keep you. Ian and Linda, your child now belongs to God in Christ, and from this point on, the Christian community is his home. There will always be a very special place kept for him here. You are witnesses to his baptism, and I hope that as he grows, you will explain it to him and unfold to him the rich treasure that has been given to him today, that as he grows to maturity, he will make his own confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you promise, depending on God's grace, to teach your child the truths and duties of the Christian faith, and by your prayers and by your example, to bring him up in the life and worship of the church. And to you, the Christian congregation of this church, you too are called to play your part in the Christian upbringing of this child and all children in our midst. You are called to set a good and happy example of Christian love and fellowship, and to provide the means by which all children may grow up in the love and knowledge of God through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. To show that you all so agree, would you all please stand? And may God grant us all strength faithfully to fulfill these promises. Would you be seated? Infant baptism has so much to say to us of our helplessness and God's all-embracing act of salvation through his son's death upon the cross. It really has all already been done for us. Our sins are forgiven, and a new way is open to us, back to God and back to heaven. And God's promises do not depend on how young we are or how old we are, how simple we are or how clever we are, when we take that step of faith.
the reason I'm being baptized this Sunday is I believe in Jesus Christ. And when I go to church, I see a community in the church that I would like to become a part of. And being baptized is the first step in becoming, uh, in joining the church. And also it's a way of declaring my faith in Jesus Christ. And it's also a part of, uh, it's also a way of becoming part of that community in the church and supporting the church. So that's why I'm looking forward to being baptised on Sunday. Alfred and Isabel, do you repent of your sins with a humble and contrite heart, and do you place your trust in the mercy of God, which is in Christ Jesus? Do. do you present yourselves for baptism today, earnestly desiring that you may be ingrafted into Christ as members of his body, the church? Do. do you promise to make diligent use of the means of grace and be faithful members of the church of God? Isabel, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Alfred, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Defend, O God, these your servants with your heavenly grace, that they may continue yours forever, and may grow daily in the Holy Spirit more and more, until they come to your everlasting kingdom. Amen. Alfred and Isabel, through baptism, you have now entered into the new life in Christ. And in his name, he who is the king and the head of the church, and by authority of this Kirk session, I now admit you to the fellowship of the Lord's table, and along with two members of our Kirk session, have the privilege of extending to you the right hand of fellowship. Welcome, Alfred. Welcome, Isabel.
Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the community of faith, the Church, and for the courage and faith of all those men and women who, from the time of the Apostles, preached the gospel of the living Christ, those who were strong in the face of persecution, those who brought the good news to this land of ours, and for those who, in recent years, have gone out to teach and to preach in the name of Christ their Lord. We rejoice in the community of faith throughout the world, and especially in our own land, our own congregation, wherever that might be, the church on the corner or down the street, or that place of worship where one day long since we sat or knelt to pray, celebrated some joyous event, or joined in some solemn memorial. We thank you for those who serve in our churches, for those who seek to lead our young people and give them direction in life, for welcome, love, and Christian fellowship. May we all, grasping your majesty and might, be filled with your Holy Spirit, that the church today, like the early church, may preach and live the gospel of Christ in eagerness, power, and love. Grant this, O Lord, that your name may be honoured before the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us when we pray as one great family to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and glory forever. Amen. We're very pleased you've been able to join with us today as we've been celebrating our community of faith. And now may the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon each one of you and all those whom you know and love, whatever they may be, this day and forevermore. At 10 past one this afternoon, Brian Walden will be interviewing John Smith, Labour Party leadership. Kellogg's Frosties. They're great. When you've hit a home run, there's nothing like the great taste of Frosties as part of your nutritious breakfast. Long. When you want to liven up a meal, nothing beats the taste of ragu pasta sauce based on an authentic 50-year-old Italian family recipe. 
You've brightened a day that was drear, dear. The rain is no longer a pain. Your meal's done the trick for us here, dear. Oh, please. Mum's done it again. Well, it was nothing, though I confess. I'm glad my pastor's such a success. You've made a day now. Oh, thanks to you. I couldn't have done it without Ragu. Ragu brings out the Italian in you. Break your back weeding your path all year. Or you can use Path Clear. Path Clear from ICI keeps paths, drives, and patios clear all year. There is a valley to take you to where the chefs get going as the sun breaks through. And only the best will do the food. The chefs down at some valley have got. Recipe for you. We do 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 great chicken and we do great turkey too. And this is the one more people are picking. It don't hang around because it's real quick chicken. Sun Valley, where only the best will do do do. They should have known. It's got so out of control. Putting Bassett's licorice all sorts into a handy sized bag. This is bound to happen. like we're the only ones left. Bassett's licorice all sorts. One too many, and you might turn Bertie. Well, now, Let's Rejoice brings us our church service today from Fraserburgh Old Church. Good morning. Welcome to Fraserburgh and the Old Parish Church here. We've been joined in our worship this morning by the pupils and staff of Lochbots Primary School. And we're pleased especially to welcome you at home also to our worship. We're rejoicing in community because our town of Fraserburgh is 400 years old this year. And our children in school have also been thinking about the wider community of the nation and the world. So today is a celebration of community. And of course, every community, be it large or small, is made up of individuals like you and me. As the school is now going to sing for us, if I were a butterfly, I'd thank you, Lord, for giving me wings. But I just thank you, Father, for making me, me.
Let us pray. Thank you, Father God, for all those people who help us day by day. For people who keep us from harm and danger. For people who help us to have the things we need. For those who teach us how to do things. And for all who love and care for us. Amen. Amen. So many things to be thankful for and so many people to be thankful to. We in the northeast of Scotland have good cause to be thankful to the RNLI and the crew of our local lifeboat. Some of our children visited the lifeboat just the other day. So Jack, they launched the boat. This small screw is undone. And normally the launcher just puts one head with a hammer on there, releases the hook, and the boat goes away. And with low water, which means there's a longer distance to go, the boat could be doing about 30 mile an hour before it. It's, so it's quite a spectacular event. Since I was 85, I think it would be able to uh, certainly, certainly do life saving at that time. At some risk, yes, there's been uh, actually three lifeboat disasters in Fresno here one in 1919, one in 53, and one in 1970. So it's, uh, it's been quite a cost of life. Uh, five men lost in the 1971, and now six men lost in 1953. We don't really know what motivates men to do it, but uh, in my own case, it's, uh, it's a feeling of a death. We, we needed a lifeboat one time around in Scrabster a number of years ago, a very dirty night. My father, my brother, and myself uh, just about lost our lives in Scrabster. Uh, we joined the crew just uh, shortly before that time, and it's really a, a sense of getting involved in the community. It's a seafaring port, and really, uh, you read being a bit in the debt of society, you just got out of it. And, uh, it's a worthwhile job. Why men do it, I don't really know. I've no, I've no answer. Everybody's got their own reasons. In all weathers, lifeboat crews from all over Britain go to sea, sometimes in the most terrible conditions, to rescue usually total strangers. Because, of course, all of life is precious as the school choir now sings for us, with words written by their head teacher, Miss Patricia Scott, and music by their music teacher, Mrs. Lena Logan.
The work of the Lifeboat Service makes us ask the question, who is my neighbor? And Jesus had some very strong views on that. He told a story once. Master, what must I do to earn eternal life? What is written in the law? What do you read about your problem there? The law tells us you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You have answered well. Do this and eternal life belongs to you. Well then, who is my neighbor? Once upon a time, a traveler set off by himself to go from Jerusalem to Jericho. Robbers jumped out on him, attacked him, and stripped him of everything he had, and then ran off. The man lay more dead than alive at the roadside. Then a priest chanced along that same road. But when he noticed the man, he passed on his way. A little later, a Levite came along that road. But when he noticed the man, he too passed on his way. The man lay helpless and wounded for a long time. Then another traveler came along. He was a Samaritan. And when he noticed the man, he took pity on him and helped him. From his traveler bags, he took olive oil and bathed the wounded man's cuts. He tore strips of cloth from his clothes and bandaged up his wounds. The Samaritan took the wounded man to the inn, where all night he looked after him. Before continuing with his journey the next day, the Samaritan took two silver Roman denarii from his bag and gave them to the innkeeper with the instruction to look after the wounded man well and that he would return and pay any extra expenses. Which of these three men do you think was more neighbor to the man who got beaten up by the robbers? The man who took pity on him and helped him. Well, you go away and do this yourself. Who is my neighbor? asked the scribe. And it was a very good question. And Jesus answered it. It was a very foolish thing for the man to have been on the road by himself in the first place, because the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was notoriously dangerous. And he was asking for trouble. And he got it. And it was his own fault. And yet, says Jesus, such a person is still our neighbor to be helped. How many people around us do we see bringing trouble on themselves? But they too are our neighbors. The Samaritan was a foreigner. Indeed, he came from a nation whom the Jews despised. And yet he went to the aid of not a fellow countryman, but someone who was almost an enemy. Our neighbor then, says Jesus, is anyone anywhere in need. And in a shrinking world, that may mean Africa, Asia, South America, Eastern Europe. They are our neighbors too, in a worldwide community of brothers and sisters for whom Christ has died. 
And also, the help that the Good Samaritan gave was practical, wasn't it? He didn't just feel sorry for the man lying on the road. His heart went out to him in pity, certainly, but he felt compassion for him. And the word compassion means to suffer with someone. And Jesus calls us similarly to suffer with those neighbors in need, however near or however far they may be from us. When Jesus had told the story of the Good Samaritan, he turned to the scribe and he said, and you, you go and do the same. Let us pray. Today, dear Lord God, we remember the nations of the world, great powerful nations and very small ones, well-to-do countries and very poor ones, countries where people have plenty to eat and others where people starve, people in lands where there is freedom and those who are often afraid. We pray for those who need help and for the rulers of all the nations that we may all learn to help each other and live together in peace. Amen. Amen.
And now may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon each one of you and all those whom you know and love, wherever they may be, this day and forevermore. Amen. Well, coming up in a couple of minutes here on Grampy in our programme, which examines d disabled issues, is Link. Meanwhile, let's... Of course it's not really that easy. The reality is that in all weathers and conditions fishermen go out sometimes for two weeks at a time to chase an ever dwindling supply of fish and once a year fishermen and their families from Fraserburgh in the northeast of Scotland come together to thank God and to ask his blessing on the fleet. For tonight's songs of praise we join this service at a special time as Fraserburgh is 400 years old this year. And we begin with a hymn that is usually sung at harvest, but for the people of Fraserburgh, those are the fields, and this is the harvest.
There's been a fishing industry in Fraserborough since the middle of the 16th century, and with every new jetty and harbour, the fleet has grown. A variety of boats developed, but by the 19th century, Zulus and Fifees had become the most common. Of all species landed, herring was the principal catch, and by the beginning of this century, the port was processing 300,000 barrels a year, most of that for export to the Baltic. Boats and fish are fewer now. It's half past three in the morning and we're aboard the fishing boat Heather Girl. It's a relatively calm night. Once the nets are cast, we'll wait for more than five hours before bringing them in. With depleted fish stocks, the crew can often catch nothing. Jimmy Urquhart's been at sea for 27 years. Eight years ago, his father retired at the age of 70, leaving him as skipper of Heather Girl. When I first started to see uh, with nothing in the, in the wheelhouse except a steering wheel and uh, we advanced into a AK meter and then we went from there into a wireless. But now there's all kind of equipment now. We always used to fish for haddock and cod, mostly. But in the morning, in the summer time, when we used to shoot our nets, the, we got a lot of prawns and we used to take them and shield them over the side because they're no value. They're of plenty of value now if you catch them. There's a few in this hall, but the catch as a whole is only a fraction of what it would have been 10 years ago. We seem to live in a rat piss, but I'm just living here for a while because the, the Bible says that I've no continuing city in this world and I'm looking for a better life someday. When the Bible says that when Jesus went to heaven, he said he will come back and receive me unto, him, unto himself. So I'm waiting for the day. I'm living for the day and waiting for the day that he'll come back for me. Uh, I've chosen the Fresbury Gospel Male Boy Square, singing Steer for Home. And most fishermen, even though they are people that love to catch fish, their, their heart is always at home from their families. They love to come home and see their families. Well, that hymn speaks about the sinner finding God and steering for home. That great home that we have in heaven. See God's mercy brightly beaming from his lighthouse on the shore. Steer to yonder light that's streaming. Sail by storm. Oh! 
It's clear from the New Testament that Jesus' fishermen disciples didn't just catch fish. Mending nets was also part and parcel of the job, and 2,000 years on, it's no different. But there inevitably comes a time when repairs are impossible and new nets are needed. Government regulations about the size of mesh are also changing, and that too means new nets. After 24 years as a fisherman, bad health forced William George Sutherland ashore, where he eventually set up his own net-making business. We shape the nets together here, we put them, the, the parts together, the netting, and then down below we put the ropes on the nets, the ground rope, the head rope with the floats, the ground rope with the, the rubbers, what we call rubbers, that, they, that weights the net down on the floor of the seabed. The hymn I've chosen is, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, being so closely connected to the sea, we, we find that some days the, the sea can be so peaceful, and the next time the billows can be rolling in, and it's, life is something very similar. Sometimes it's peaceful, sometimes it's lovely, sometimes it's, we go through deep waters, but nevertheless, he abides constantly. He is our companion through life and it brings peace to the soul because he is with us all the way. Fraserburgh developed a massive industry around fish gutting, and this survived well into the present century. Herring needed pickled or cured, and in 1864 there were 14 separate curing yards. Nowadays there's more mackerel than herring, and preservation methods have changed, but the fish processing industry is still at the heart of the town's economy. 
Canning factories like this are highly mechanized and can reduce mackerel sardines and sprats to an appropriate size before immersing them in a variety of sauces in which they eventually find their way to our supermarket shelves. Whitefish, on the other hand, is usually filleted before being dipped in breadcrumbs or smoked and then frozen. But there's more to Fraserburgh than just fish. With its excellent beaches and sand dunes, there's a thriving tourist industry, and the Buchan countryside behind supports some of Britain's most prosperous agriculture. There's also a thriving social life. Alexa Gunn's been teaching all kinds of dance for 35 years. Well, but four years ago, some of the mothers that attend the class with our youngsters said they would like to do tap dancing. And I had a free evening, so I said, right, why not we'll have a class? And it's just going from strength to strength. The whole winter, every Thursday night, we meet and have a good laugh and a tap dance. And, oh, just super. Just local girls. That has, most of them have said they wanted to do it when they were younger, couldn't do it because they did other things. Now they're all blossoming and they're all tap dancing. And they love it. It's a super class. I've always had faith. Every family has good times and bad times, and my family has had its fair share of bad times. I had a niece killed, a nephew died with cancer, my husband contacted cancer eight years ago, had months and months of chemotherapy, dreadful chemotherapy, but he's better and cured, and I thank God for that, and I prayed to God when he was ill, and I prayed after he was better, because I feel God helped me through that time. He helped my husband through that time. And the strength I received from my faith and from the West Church and from Mr. Lyon was a great help to me. You just see a light at the end of the tunnel, and that's faith, I think, for me. Tell me about the hymn you've chosen. I've chosen I Need Thee Every Hour simply because the third verse relates to my situation and my family situation. I need the every hour in joy and pain. And I think all families has this time of joy and they have a time of pain. And I think it's a suitable hymn because you do need God every hour in joy and pain. I It's largely forgotten, but for eight years at the end of the 16th century, Fraserburgh was a university town, but only its stone representation of the Ten Commandments survives, now in the South Church. 
Built at much the same time was a castle, which proved too cold for its builders, and 200 years later, Scotland's first lighthouse rose from its midst. Down from the castle, astride a cave, is its chapel. As well as stairs to the top chamber, there's a door to the bottom room, while access to the secret middle chamber is through a concealed trap door. And hanging from the roof of the top room are some of the finest surviving heraldic pendants in Scotland, one of them featuring a detailed sculpture of the crucifixion. The heart is damaged, but the crown of thorns and pierced hands are clear. Six weeks ago, the Queen joined local people in celebrating their 400 years as a royal borough. And it was the Queen who was responsible for popularising the tune to our next psalm. It was composed by 20-year-old Jesse Irvin, whose father was the minister here at Crimmond Parish Church. In 1859, Jesse was attending music classes, and one piece of homework was to compose a tune to accompany a psalm. She wrote Crimmond, and 90 years later, that piece of homework was chosen by the Queen for her wedding and has since become the favourite tune for Psalm 23, The Lord's My Shepherd. It's now incorporated into an expanded Fraserburgh, but Braidsey was once a fishing village in its own right, where in 1740 two-thirds of its men were drowned in a shipwreck. Fraserburgh's lifeboat also has a tragic history, and in the last 70 years three boats have been lost. Most recently in 1970, the lifeboat capsized and five of the six crew were drowned. So why does Coxon Albert Sutherland do it? Well, I don't really know why we do it. We, we do it out of a sense of duty to try and return a wee bit of what uh, society's done for us, I think, that's great to great. I actually needed a lifeboat away back in 1968, I think it was, up in Scrapster. And uh, really, at that time, we were very in a very bad position. My brother, my father, myself, aboard the boat. And we, we nearly lost our lives that night. And, uh, really, when they asked for a crew for this boat after the last boat was lost, uh, my brother and myself, two brothers in fact, myself, volunteered. So 
It's really a sense of duty and a return on some of the environment that you're in. Do you, do you feel that your faith also motivates you to do things for others in this way? Yes, of course it does. Uh, faith without works is dead, as it says in God's Word. And I believe God's Word from end to end, and uh, I believe that faith without works is, is dead. So we we'll have to do a practice of faith with works. So yes. this is your form of works? This is my form of works, if you want to put it that way. I believe in the great Creator. And we see around about us even the night, the creation, the sort of uh, environment we're in at the moment. The sea can be so powerful, the wind and the waves and one thing or another. And we see the sky, the different climates of the day, even this day we've spent the day. Rain, sunshine, hail, whatever. You. And yet, I believe in, in the spiritual side of it, that these things feed back to us through nature, through the environment that we're in. And I can see the, the, the hand of God, even the environment that we're in, at this very point of time, God is present with me this time. Some disasters the lifeboat can't prevent. Three years ago, James Duthie's father died when the fishing boat Majestic went down. Well, at the time, I was off school sick and I was watching the television with my mother and then the neighbour came in and it was all that broken news to us. We never heard anything from anyone. It had been in the radio, it had been in the TV, but we still hadn't, hadn't heard. So, at the time, I rushed into Fraserburgh at the school and I took my little brother out and broke news to him. And most of the time I, I've actually been trying to compensate my father for my brother, although he doesn't realise sometimes. That's what I've really tried to do. And for every ship in this area which has been lost, there is a plaque. Here in the memorial room of the Royal National Mission to Deep Sea Fishermen, 150 fishermen who lost their lives are remembered. David Mann is the superintendent of the mission here in Fraserburgh. David, what impact can the loss of a boat have on a community like this? It's an enormous impact because people here not only grieve for those who have been lost, but they grieve with them. In many cases, some might be relatives, very close friends. The fishing community is a very tight-knit community and people really feel for them very much. How do you help people in such tragic circumstances? In many cases, it's just a matter of being there and showing that you care. Initially, of course, people want to know information, and information that's accurate, you need to know it quickly. But also, as the time goes by, we need to be that kind of friend with whom people can share their feelings, because most of the men who are lost at sea, their bodies are never recovered. There is no funeral, there is no grave, 
There is no place of remembrance. And that presumably is why you have this memorial. Indeed it is. Now, the hymn you've chosen for this Songs of Praise is Eternal Father Strong to Save. It's a hymn that is very much a favourite of yours, but one that has painful memories for your mother. Yes, indeed. My father was lost at sea three days after I was born, and the ship went down with loss of all the crew. And I remember very clearly in my young years that she could never bring herself to sing that hymn, Eternal Father, strong to save. Why didn't he? Why did my dad lose his life? And then as the years went by, I came to realize that there was far more involved than just God's protection in this life and how very much more important it is that we think in terms of our eternal security. The mission is involved in every aspect of the fishing community, but in many ways the highlight of the year is the blessing of the fleet. In Fraserburgh we very much depend upon the fishing industry, so it's absolutely essential that we get together, give thanks to God for his providential care for the fleet, and also to commit to him our concerns for the future. Lord. Your first disciples were fishermen. They knew the storms and perils of the deep. They also knew your presence with them in their darkest hours and when fear filled their minds. Today, we pray for all fishermen who face similar hazards and anxieties. Lord of the sea, be near to protect them and to meet every need. May they hear your voice above the storm saying, it is I. Do not be afraid. Bless with your peace every boat of this fleet and grant them catches that are worthy of their labors. Bless with your constant presence their homes and families. Bless with your comfort those who have lost loved ones in fishing accidents. May they know that you are also the resurrection and the life. Bless with your healing fishermen who have suffered serious injury and who may face unemployment. Now may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and abide upon the fishing fleet of Fraserburgh and upon us all, today and forever.
In next week's Songs of Praise, Karen Keating joins 3,000 young people in Northamptonshire as they celebrate their faith with folk groups, steel bands and an orchestra. And next week's programme will be on BBC Two.